born in Vietnam. Raised in Germany. Becoming one of the youngest politicians in Germany. Holding important positions in Switzerland. Returning to Vietnam. It's destiny. Hello and welcome to Talk Vietnam. The man you've just met in the clip has a special destiny. Starting off as an orphan in Vietnam, he came to Germany and made his way to a high position in his political career as one of the youngest vice chancellor and federal minister of economics and technology of Germany, and also the first of Asian background. Despite his roles in different governments and institutions later on, the destiny always led him back to where he was born, which is Vietnam. And now it's becoming a responsibility, as he said, a promise of contributing to the country's development. So what are some of the stories not yet known in his special journey? We'll find out more in our program today with Dr. Philip Rosler, the Honorary Consul of Vietnam to the Swiss cantons of Zurich and Zurich. Hello and welcome Mr. Philip Rosler to our program today. Hi, hello. And the very first time in Talk Vietnam, so it's such an honor to have you here with us. Oh, the honor's on my side. Thank you so much. Yeah. First of all, may I say congratulations on your new position as yeah. the uh, honorary consul uh, of Vietnam in uh, Switzerland. Mm -hmm. um, so can you tell us a little bit more about this new position? Yeah, so I'm really honored because it's um, a positioning where my responsibility is that I will support all the Vietnamese who are based mainly in Zug and Zurich, but means certainly in, in entire Switzerland. And if they have a problem, be it with the administration, be it in business, so they can come to me and I will try to help. And on the other hand, I can facilitate business relationships between Switzerland and Vietnam. And I was appointed last year, 2021, and it was exactly the year where we could celebrate the 50th anniversary of the diplomatic relationship between Switzerland and Vietnam. So it was a very important year and I hope that I can build on an excellent relationship and foster the bilateral relationship between Switzerland and Vietnam. We are very curious uh, in the first place, why did you accept this new position? As you mentioned at the beginning, um, I was born in Vietnam and had you know, the chance of my life in Germany. And now I think it's up to me to give back to the next generation. I traveled way more to Vietnam than ever before. I got in touch with the startup community, with the industry, with the politicians. So it was really nice and I saw the, the opportunity, the chances for this country. And, and I was inspired and uh, the people have been so open and so nice and I was really moved. So that I decided, okay, this is my mm -hmm. destiny. I realized it, that I have to support the people there. So I got, again, once my chance, Mm -hmm. And now it's on 100 million of peoples in Vietnam. Born on February 24, 1973, in Kong Hung, Ba Swin, now Suk Trung Province, Philip Rosler was orphaned and raised in the Catholic orphanage of the Sister Divine Providence, Portio. When he was nine months old, a German couple adopted him and brought him back to Germany. Growing up in a family with a well-rounded educational environment, he was trained to become a combat medic, like his adoptive father, a military officer. With great ability and determination, Philip Ross was the first cabinet minister and vice chancellor of Asian background in Germany. So now we want to uh, go back in time a little bit, um, back to your childhood. You were adopted by uh, your parents, right, in Germany. Did they tell you about your origin, your Vietnamese origin? They have had already two daughters, so my older siblings. And um, so we were talking about, but when my parents got divorced, when I was four, I went with my father, which was back then uh, quite unique. And when I was six, because I can remember, and you know, your memory starting with six, 
then he put me in front of the mirror together with him and said, look, look um, you look different, your eyes, your nose. And so, but I don't care at all. So uh, I'm your father, you're my son, that's it. And since then it was pretty clear um, that, you know, I look different. That's what six year old boy can understand if you say, look, you're adopted. Mm -hmm. uh, but then it, it was the story and, and I was fine with. So you stay with your father while yeah, your stay with two father. siblings stay with your mom. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, and then my father was a military uh, uh, helicopter pilot. So, and uh, as always in armies across the world, uh, you have to travel a lot through the country, so I grew up, by the way, then in a military compound. Then it's not that far away to decide to become, by yourself, a military guy. And I want to become also a helicopter pilot, so... Uh, and uh, then I started with, with um, flying, gliding, so it's allowed... So you know how to fly a helicopter? Not a helicopter, but I have a couple of licenses mm -hmm. for uh, uh, private planes, wow. uh, for ultralights, so... Because I wanted to become a pilot as well, so I started when I was 14. Uh, so mm -hmm. there was a passion before politics, even school time. And um, then I decided to join the army, but you can only become an engineer or a doctor and then become a pilot. And only two, ah, two doctors are pilots in a huge army back then. And then I decided, okay, then I become one of these two doctors mm. who are doctors and at the same time pilots. So, it turns that out it's not. <laughs> yeah, it turns out that that it, that it, that is maybe way more in if you're a physician than than being a flying doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, however, but coming back to your question, so um, you learn certainly to be in your way of life sort of disciplined, mm -hmm. um, hardworking. Again, very Prussian we would say in Germany and Vietnamese, and um, and Swiss, hardworking. <laughs> and to be uh, sort of persistent as well. Yeah. So was it hard um, being trained as a doctor? Because med student, medical student, I know it's a really tough life. You have to learn a lot, right? You have to learn a lot. So we're just sort of, let's say, not boring, but it's a little uh, uniform. Mm. Um, and uh, what I was missing back then was to have some discussions or some talks. So I decided to start in parallel some, some other studies in history and philosophy, mm -hmm. uh, which was nice, but only for two years, because then I really, you know, uh, ramped up my political engagement. So then I had enough discussions, history, and uh, not philosophy that much, but yeah. yeah. And, um, but yeah, so it's, uh, the, the become a physician is, uh, it's, it's quite tough, but you know, but if did you actually perform in surgeries? And, uh, so I have a PhD uh, mm -hmm. in heart surgery. Um, and um, later on, I wanted to become an ophthalmologist. So it's a mm. tiny eye field, eye. eye doctor. Right. And um, yeah, so it's, it's because it's both. You have surgery, eye surgery. But at the same time, you can, can make it, we call it conservative. So only with pharmaceuticals and, and special treatment mm -hmm. and glasses, of course. Um, but, um, you know, then I joined politics and I left uh, the army as well as the medicinal uh, field. Right. Can you share with us uh, the milestones, significant milestones in your career in politics? Yeah, maybe the, the, the most important stuff which was triggering me was it's about leadership. And I was not only a doctor, but a military doctor, which has a lot to do with leadership as well, because mm. of military leadership. And then I decided, OK, that's what you like. And then I was in parallel to my college time, always doing some politics in the youth organization. And we have been in tough times back then as a party outside the, the state parliament. 
And then I decided to join the youth organization, to join the party, to be engaged. I was then in the party board and I became the secretary general of our party. Right. That's quite often, it's like <laughs> more managing director, <laughs> political managing director. But I did this and yeah, I brought back, together with the chairman certainly, uh, the party into the parliament after nine years of absence. And uh, then I became immediately the, 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 the chairman of the parliamentarian group of the caucus inside the parliament. Mm -hmm. And um, I was leading the coalition uh, together with my counterpart in the coalition. And then my mentor, the chairman said, okay, now it's time for you to become the chairman. But listen, if you are the chairman of the party, you have to become minister mm -hmm. first. And um, for our party, we are very economic minded, uh, very tolerant, but also societal questions, but very economic minded. So he said to me, so if you would like to become chairman, my successor, then it's fine, I will support you, but you have to become Minister of Economics. Mm. So then it was, you know, not of training, you cannot train uh, and, as a uh, minister, yeah, of as a minister but, right. but I was, you know, brought in touch with all the different communities in the mm. economy and in, in the local state. And, uh, for example, our state owns 20% uh, of Volkswagen. So um, it's quite important to be, you know, have a knowledge about uh, German car manufacturing. Mm. And um, so I was brought up to speed. And then he said, now it's a moment to, to change. There was in between a campaign, we won the campaign. Uh, I was already chairman, but then he said, now it's time to become a deputy prime minister and minister of economics as well. So that's well, the beginning of my career on, on a state level. Right. You took the responsibility for the Minister of Economics and Technology as well, right? Yeah, so I was two years uh, Federal Minister of Health. And this time, so we have been as a party in sort of rough water. Mm. And so people said something must change at the top. And there have not been that many other people. And once, you know, they said, maybe it's on you, Philip. And then I said, OK, why not? Mm -hmm. And then I changed from Minister of Health to Minister of Economy. And what I said before is, usually my party is focusing on, on the Foreign Ministry, Ministry of Justice, mm. and the Ministry of Economy. I see. Uh, these are the main pillars of, 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 of liberals in government in right. Germany. Very not, important ministers. Yeah, and yeah. not at all, back then at least, Minister of Health. And they said, look, of course you can become uh, uh, our chairman, but if you would like to become chairman, quite similar to what my mentor once said to me, you have to become Minister of Economy. Mm -hmm. And since I was already Minister of Economy in, in Lower Saxony, and I really love the idea of economy, um, then I said, okay, then, then I will change the portfolio. And it's up to the chairman to decide, you know, what ministry you will pick. And then I decided to switch. Right. And then I moved on with Minister of uh, Economy Technology uh, and Vice Chancellor because of partner of a bigger party in a coalition in Germany is always the vice chancellor. So the bigger party, back then the ruling party CDU, uh, with Angela Merkel as the chancellor and then I became the vice chancellor. Right. At that time when you were the minister of e economy, um, what was your view about Vietnam uh, at that time? A minister ha gets a lot of advice and so I get a huge file and in this file all the macroeconomic facts are in there, the numbers, the GDP, uh, you know, GDP per capita and so on. And that's what I was reading and I, I could even read in the numbers that Vietnam was in the year 2012 very dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, uh, seeing the growth which was back then one of the biggest growth in the entire Asian region, not only ASEAN but Asian uh, region. And so it was already fascinating and I, I could feel that my advisor and the ministry, my civil servants have been also intrigued and fascinated by Vietnam, you know, because before you make a trip, you invite all your people in the ministry who are experts in Vietnam or in the region mm -hmm. or both, and then they explained it. And it was in difference to many other countries, and I'm telling the truth, listen to me, um, it's, it's really, so they have been so passionate and I've never seen it before with other countries, not to name them, but it was really quite exciting for me. So it was well prepared. And um, that um, was my view when I arrived here in, in Hanoi. Mm -hmm. That is a very dynamic and vibrant and interesting country.
Philip Rosshorst's connection with Vietnam started many years ago. It began when he was vice chancellor of Germany. The connection with Vietnam was tightened when he was managing director of the World Economic Forum and further elevated when he became honorary consul of Vietnam in Switzerland. Not many people know that on that path, Philip Rossler received great support from a special woman. Đầu tiên gặp trực tiếp Philip vào năm 2020, đầu năm 2020, nhân dịp đoàn Phó Thủ tướng Thường trực Trương Hòa Bình sang dự Diễn đàn Kinh tế Thế giới tại Davos. Cá nhân tôi đúng là tôi cũng thấy là Philip là một con người thực sự năng động, có một cái trí tuệ rất là sắc sảo, nhạy bén. Tôi cảm thấy rằng là Philip Rosler tình cảm hướng về quê hương, cái sự gắn bó với Việt Nam có lẽ là nó lớn lên theo ngày tháng, theo những hoạt động mà ông đã được tham gia cùng, được đóng góp cùng, hỗ trợ cùng. When Mr. Philip Rosler and his family moved to Switzerland at this Vietnamese restaurant, Ambassador Lei Ling Lan met and encouraged him to contribute more to Vietnam. Soon after that, Mr. Philip Rosler came to Vietnam in November 2020. He led a business delegation of European investors, overcoming many travel restrictions due to the COVID-19 pandemic to come to Vietnam. Một chuyến đi đặc biệt trên nhiều phương diện vì nó diễn ra vào đúng vào thời điểm khi mà những cái biện pháp hạn chế xã hội về trong thời gian dịch bệnh rất là khắc, rất là khắt khe, rất là ngặt nghèo. Nhưng mà chúng tôi thấy rằng là trong một thời gian khá là gấp rút mà cũng tổ chức một cái đoàn 10 người doanh nghiệp của Thụy Sĩ, Đức, châu Âu rồi là có cả Israel và Việt Nam đã dẫn đến một cái kết quả là rất đáng khích lệ là quyết định đầu tư 350 triệu đô sau cái chuyến thăm đấy là một thực sự là một kỳ tích. You face some uh, challenges uh, to uh, come here. Uh, I mean during uh, 2020. Uh, tell me all about that because it's um you had to overcome so many challenges. Yeah, it was before the, the vaccination was uh, there, so it was really only manageable with a lot of tests. The tests have been have to be done in a quite specific way, and you have to realize this specific way, and it had to be documented, and the allies were asking for the right documents, and so you had such a huge bunch of paper before you can even onboard the plane. Mm -hmm. Then you have to make a test in between, and you, you, know, you have your connecting time, and then you have to wait there, but with quarantine and, and isolated. So it was not easy to travel, but it was worth the effort to come. Um, and there have been back then no usual operating airlines flying mm -hmm. to Vietnam because no one was allowed to come in. So it was really quite difficult to, to get a flight to Vietnam. At the end we made it because they brought in still some products with planes mm. and um, so they opened some planes for passengers again. So it was a sort of an adventure mm -hmm. to come in, have these blue coats on and the mask and, and even the hats, everything was, you know, uh, isolated and protected. But given the situation back then, it was the right way of, of even then allowing it. And was an exception because even back then the government said, look, there will be once a time after COVID and we should prepare our country f exactly for that very time. Mm -hmm. And we need investors f for the time after COVID. So why not inviting them already now? Mm, so yeah. that was smart, yeah. but facing some challenges. Um, well, but what yeah. motivated you to overcome all of the challenges like that? Yeah, again, so if, if you really say that's your destiny and your passion to support the country, then you would, again, s would say exactly the same, that the best way to prepare the country uh, for the time after the crisis is already in the crisis. Mm. So that's the reason why we came and say, look, uh, and we don't know when it will be over, but it will be over once. Mm -hmm. So, and then let's prepare everything for this um, very engagement. And that's the reason why we brought in some investors. They could already get a glimpse of what's going on, where the opportunities, mm -hmm. and they can use the time back home to find some investors and say, look, why don't you come with me, join up forces, join up money and bring this money to Vietnam. Right. The easiest way to push forward Vietnam in terms of economy, but also in terms of society, is really to, to support the, the, the next 
generation of entrepreneurs. And this should be the main focus also of a business delegation. They can see, oh, because there's still a lot of money around in investors' hand. Mm -hmm. And before they go again to the Silicon Valley or again to Berlin, uh, why not uh, going to East Asia? And um, that's what we have to highlight. And um, I hope that mm -hmm. the community of honorary consuls or whoever is uh, outside will highlight exactly these opportunities, particularly if we talk about 5.3 million overseas Vietnamese, mm -hmm. each one of them can be an ambassador for Vietnam and can say, look, um, this is Vietnam, this is the country where I'm coming from, I'm proud of because look what's going on there and why don't you invest there as well? And certainly they themselves can say, look, oh, now it's the right moment to come back mm -hmm. and to share not only my network, but also my business right. uh, with my home country. Mm -hmm. Actually, I quite like the word uh, leapfrogging that mm -hmm. you kept mentioning. Um, and uh, you think that um, the, uh, the action plan for, for leapfrogging relies on uh, technology um, and also startup right and startup actually plays a very important role right in mm -hmm. your agenda so uh, can you share more about that i've been particularly inspired by the by the startup community um, um, i brought them together with some startups here in vietnam and also in my capacity as a chairman what i mentioned from Vienna capital ventures i brought once our vietnamese startups mm -hmm. around 20 to the silicon valley okay and guess what um, vietnam has not the honorary consul a real consul general in uh, San Francisco mm. and um, an entire team, I think five people or so. Right. And they promised to support all the Vietnamese who are going abroad, to going overseas. And when I was a minister, I created a so-called German Silicon Valley Accelerator. Mm. Again, what I mentioned, the bridge between Berlin, Düsseldorf, Munich and Hamburg mm -hmm. and the Silicon Valley. Right. Right. And we sent them for three months to Silicon Valley and then they're coming back and maybe another three months. So, and that's what my dream is after COVID for Vietnamese startups as well. Hmm. Because they have been so fascinating from the entrepreneurial spirit. Dr. Philip Rossler considers investing in young people as his top priority. For him, the startup community in Vietnam has many advantages to go global. But what they lack is a bridge. Therefore, during his meetings with Vietnamese startups, when he was the managing director of the World Economic Forum in 2016, in addition to inspiring young people, he emphasized his mission to Vietnam. That is, to support Vietnamese startups to go global. Anh Rosler cũng đã chứng kiến và thúc đẩy cái sự hình thành của mạng lưới đổi mới sáng tạo thủ đô, trong đó bao gồm 17 trường đại học, 4 hội sinh viên Việt Nam ở Anh, Pháp, Mỹ, Úc, kết nối được 154 quỹ đầu tư mạo hiểm ở trong khu vực châu Á Thái Bình Dương với 783 startup và từ đó thì những cái khoản đầu tư đã được hình thành và tổng giá trị nó lên đến khoảng 1,7 tỷ đô và rất nhiều trong số đó là nhờ vào cái sự kết nối và hỗ trợ từ phía anh Rosler nếu không có tình cảm và nếu mà không có những cái sự trân trọng về nguồn gốc công tác của mình thì chắc là cũng khó để có một người nào đó mà 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 dành được nhiều thời gian cho cái cộng đồng khởi nghiệp Việt Nam đến vậy Dr. Philip Rossler also joined Vina Capital Ventures as chairman of the advisory board to help bring more capital into Vietnamese startups in different fields. Over the years, uh, I have tried to convince Philip that uh, his route is in Vietnam. I think it's, it's, it's important that we all contribute to the growth of, of Vietnam and help the people of Vietnam. With more frequent trips to Vietnam since 2016, Dr. Philip Rossler is acting as a bridge to Vietnamese startups to go global. You are actually an inspiration to the Vietnamese startup here in Vietnam because they all mentioned about how you help inspire them. Yeah. So uh, what was your impression when you uh, met and talked with the uh, Vietnamese uh, young startup? If you realize that your destiny is to, 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 to help the country you, where you have once been born, then you identify and realize, okay, that could be maybe the economy that gives opportunities to all the people living here to have a prosper life. And then if you say, okay, what does it mean? Then you realize oh, maybe that's the startup community and the digital industry and the technology. Mm -hmm. And then 
if you then try to convince the people to be there, then you will be surprised, the third surprise about Vietnam, they're already in. They already realize that technology is the future, right. at least the next generation. Mm -hmm. But also as we discussed the politicians. And so um, it's fulfilling for yourself as well. If you say, look, you have to focus on technology, you say, yeah, we are focusing on technology, Philip. Mm -hmm. So that's cool because then you can you know, join forces. You don't have to convince them anymore. They're mm -hmm. already convinced. They may be more convinced than you are. <laughs> so, and, and now it's a question how to come into action. And then we identified, okay, you need some more investments. Right, right. Identified as a challenge. And the politicians, back then Prime Minister Fook, realized, okay, yes, let's make it easier to bring in foreign direct investments, mm. to, particularly to startups. Mm -hmm. The question is how you can bring uh, you know, foreign money to, to Vietnam and how you know, once investors can get out the money. And again, so if you are there, then you can feel the spirit, the dynamic. And I brought them in touch with all the big guys in the Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they've been impressed by the Vietnamese. And they look, oh, wow. That's fascinating. And by the way, so there's a huge expatriate community, certainly in the US. Mm. And there was um, back then a tech guy and he was, you know, with roots in Vietnam. I said, look, I'm here with a bunch of uh, Vietnamese startups. He said, oh, very welcome. And then they created a sort of partnership and so on. So it's what's even already possible. And that's so fascinating because if you're convinced that this is the right way, Mm -hmm. And then you meet so many people who are so engaged, then it's really fascinating, fulfilling. And then you see, okay, you can, together you can do even more. Mm -hmm. So you are acting like a bridge and uh, helping connecting the Vietnamese uh, startup yeah. Yeah, with the um, venture funds, right? Yeah, and exactly. So if, if, if you're convinced, what I said at the beginning, that the Vietnamese startup entrepreneurs are as creative and as dynamic and entrepreneurial as all the other guys around, mm -hmm. so then the question comes up, uh, why we don't have that many investments here in Vietnam as we have it in, in the Silicon Valley. You know, the vast majority of investments is still going to, to the United States, and particularly to the Bay Area. Mm. Like San Francisco. Yeah, yeah, but but again, so why not here to 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 Hanoi, Ho Chi Minh City, Da Nang, whatever? Even if you see it from the pure investor's perspective, not with a biography in Vietnam, yeah. you realize that's a nice country to be there. Mm. And the Swiss guys I brought here to Vietnam, and I plan soon uh, next in a delegation. I would bet they have no routes to Vietnam again, right? So it's a huge distance, a long flight, mm -hmm. as you mentioned. So, but 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 uh, they will realize many similarities, and guess what? Vietnam has a very good reputation already, mm -hmm. even in Switzerland, in Europe, um, for technology, particularly for programming and coding. Mm. Look, many of the smartphones of a Korean producer are produced. The ninety percent for the global market are produced here in Vietnam. Mm then the, 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 the fancy earphones for another tech company in the Bay Area are produced in Vietnam as well. Right. And uh, the software for the most favorite payment system in Switzerland was coded from Vietnamese guys. Wow. So, and, and you have a huge uh, um, tech company here, mm -hmm. which has even a university, and I will name it as FPT, mm -hmm. and um, they are as good as SAP in some companies in Germany even. They could win a competition against SAP mm -hmm. in a German industry conglomerate. I see. So which demonstrates the quality of Vietnamese products. Not only if you talk about garments and shoes, mm. it's also still good in manufacturing but at the same time also in technology. Right. And if the people outside realize, hey, Vietnam is uh, way more than excellent food, the best food in the world, I would say, <laughs> um, and nice beaches and, and hotels, um, it's really about technology, production, and the future of economy. Right. The best food in the world is what the former German vice chancellor said about Vietnamese cuisine. That's why on this special return trip to Vietnam, Dr. Philip Rossler could not help to enjoy a warm bowl of pho in Hanoi's winter days. In a small alley, next to a row of simple tables and chairs, he happily chatted with the shop owners. It is the third generation of this nearly 70-year-old pho restaurant. So it's the third generation and this is the fourth generation. Yeah. Can take over. Yeah. 
He said he would take over because yeah. it's very delicious, right? Unlike the other diners, the former German vice chancellor also wanted to make a bowl of pho himself. It was indeed quite adept at it. Squeezing in a small alley on Ding Ting Huang Street, climbing each step of the old stairs, Dr. Rosler entered a space filled with an attractive scent. Egg coffee, the signature drink of the shop, is served by the owner himself to our special guest. Together with 60 Vietnamese from all over the world, Dr. Rossler attended the Suong Kui Huang, or Homeland Spring Program, for the first time. On his Twitter page, Dr. Rossler showed off his experiences on this trip to the world. Eating pho at Hong Kiam Lake, drinking egg coffee, visiting Temple of Literature, practicing Vietnamese calligraphy, Dr. Rossler may not be familiar with the writing technique or the style of the calligraphy K. Huang that he received from the young calligrapher Win Tang Tung, but he completely understands the meaning of this word. Đây là chữ quê hương. Đây giống như là một cái mái nhà. Còn đây là giống như một dòng sông. Đấy là hình ảnh của quê hương Việt Nam. Thank you, Professor. It's so nice and beautiful. May I ask if I if you can show me something to write as well. Calligraphy is quintessential Eastern culture in general, and Vietnamese culture in particular. Although he doesn't fully understand Vietnamese culture, the former German vice chancellor wrote a Vietnamese calligraphic letter for the first time. So, Philip, we are now at the lake. The Huan Kim Lake. And this is also your first time in Vietnam experience the atmosphere right before Tet holiday. Yeah. How is it going so far for you? It's really amazing. So uh, it's for me the first time that I'm here, as you mentioned. And I never have seen the preparations for Tet, the buzz around Tet and the emotions and the happiness around. And it was really moving for me to see, but also to learn from all these people about the personal stories and experience and preparations for TED, or even to realize that it's a real family event. And you also practiced uh, calligraphy yeah. at the Temple of Literature. Yeah. How was that experience? Yeah, there was also fascinating stuff. I've seen it quite often. I always wondered oh, how it works and how it comes together, the, the, the different swings. And then I saw it in life and had a nice professor, a teacher. And uh, yeah, it was well, fascinating stuff and, you know, one of my most favorite places in Hanoi is the Temple of Literature because it, it focuses on another topic we already raised, that's education and studying. And, and, you know, it's the oldest university in Vietnam. And the Vietnamese can be very proud of this kind of educational track record, you would say, in modern times. And it's fascinating. And I think it's part of, no, it's not only part, it's an important part of the Vietnamese culture. So do you think after this trip, um, the experience that you had would bring you closer to Vietnam? Of course, so uh, way closer, by the way. So it's really, it was really moving. Of course, I understand the, the, the tradition and the history behind why they are focusing, for example, on the family. Because there's these strong family event people traveling across the world only in uh, order to get home as soon as possible to the family for the TED celebrations. And, and they put a lot of effort to come home for TED and that's very important for them because family is very important. And the other pillar is education. And when you have been in the temple of, of literature, so it was really, you could even feel the educational spirit, right? And so I think this is the second part of the success story of Vietnam and the Vietnamese. And the third one is, um, how shall I call it, in a positive, sense the persistence to have you know idea and to fight for until you get it solved and uh, best example is how now vietnam is after the covid crisis or not know how to call it even during the covid crisis so really they they 
had a struggle as many others at the beginning and now they have managed it and they learned to live with it which is I think a smart way to deal with because sooner or later some other challenges will occur and it's good to know that a country like Vietnam will survive any challenges ahead. Well thank you so much for your sharing. Good pleasure, thank you. Yeah. Leaving Hanoi, the former German vice chancellor returned to the place where his heart belongs, Sok Trump province. I'm Philip Roslak. I haven't been here yet. So this is the first time. I have a dream to meet my family. My family is very good. My father is the one who is from the army. So my family is like the army. So my family is like the army. After nearly half a century, the boy finally returned with a lot of emotions. It was a song, but it turns out that it was, you know, our father, so the most famous pray in, in Christianity. But I was, even without this knowledge, uh, in that very moment, I was really touched. When they were holding my hand, it was so cute and so nice and felt so so cozy. It's what they done certainly for me, but it's, it's not only about me because during my time, even this very often after, they told me that they had passed 3,000 babies, right? And even if many of them, not ministers or doctors, whatever, but, but they should be grateful as I'm grateful to them. And, and, and they did it without having in mind, oh, once you will become maybe vice chancellor in Germany, they said, look, it's, it's, it's our love and we would give it to the babies. And they were in a difficult situation, and they, they did it, and so and and never asking for something, getting back. Sister Marie Denise Do Ting Dong is 75 years old. In 1972, she was a teacher at the Divine Providence School, and then worked as a nurse in the hospital. The old school is now gone. The old people are also gone. Sister Dong is the only nun who used to work here, who is still alive and has remained attached to the monastery all these years. Căn nhà này đó nó có từ năm 1888 tới nay là nó hơn 130 năm rồi. Cái nhà ở dưới á thì là để các cái lớp học, còn ở trên lầu á là nhà ngủ của các em. Lúc đó thì khoảng chừng hơn 100 em cho tới cái thời điểm 1973 đó, nó cũng mở rộng ra, lại nhận các em ở xung quanh nữa. thường nghĩa là thì từ khi mới sanh cho đến hai ba tháng thì là nhiều, còn lớn hơn một tuổi hai tuổi cũng có. Before leaving the orphanage, the nine-month-old boy used to live in one of these buildings here. Although he has absolutely no memory of this place, his emotions were still very special. What was the case and how was it looking 40 years ago, 48 years ago when I was there? It wasn't the same situation as, as the young girls are as of today. It was even more moving. It was not only your own memories, your own feelings, but also to see what happens now there with the kids. So it was double emotional. And I walked with them around. They showed me what their current life is about. They have Everything, you know, what is basic, like enough food, clothes, they have a, a home, a bed to sleep. But what they really need is, is uh, psychological support. To have someone to talk with, uh, who understands and who is there, even when they are waking up in the night and, and, and crying. Sympathizing and understanding the situation of orphans, former German Vice Chancellor Philip Rossler agreed to become the global ambassador of Care to Rise, a charity program aimed at disadvantaged children who are in difficult circumstances due to the COVID-19 pandemic in Vietnam. There's two things that, um, that I think Philip, uh, Dr. Philip Rossler can help. One is to give inspiration to the kids that uh, they need to not worry. There'll be organization, individual and people who will take good care of them and they can grow up to become someone who can help society and become successful. Two is that Dr. Philip Rosser can help raise awareness uh, in Vietnam, but also globally that these children need help.
after all of these engagement uh, and participation in different activities, talking to the top leaders, to uh, the young baby, to the you know people um, on the street. Um, do you think that the understanding of Vietnam helps uh, open up new, um, it's kind of breath of life uh, for you and uh, to help you, you know, give you more determination and uh, energy to keep on doing what you are doing? Yeah, I would say yes, of course, because um, if you don't know where you're coming from, uh, you cannot say where you would like to go, right? Mm. So you need to understand where your roots are. And again, at the beginning of my life, I had no doubt that my roots are in Germany, that they're somewhere in, in, in Hanover and around. Uh, but now, having been more brought in touch with Vietnam, I realized that you have at least a second route or additional route or additional pillar, and, and, but also additional responsibility. First, I said, look, I want to give back to Germany, so I served in the army, I served in the government. Now, I also understand that I have to serve to Vietnam and to the society of Vietnam, and that's the reason why I'm engaged. And it opens your eyes, but also motivates you. I understand more and more the Vietnamese history and philosophy, so you can adjust and shape your way of helping the country. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, what I mentioned, it's, it's, it's a, the right blend between tradition, mm -hmm. which is still important because individuals need the understanding of their roots, but societies need the right understanding of their roots as well. And right. what we call it roots for individuals, it's tradition for society. So you need your tradition, and at the same time, you have to modernize it. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is what, what, what is the job to do for Vietnam, to keep the, the nice tradition, like Tet, mm -hmm. but also, and that's from my understanding, the, the message behind Tet, the focus on family. Mm -hmm. And because there have been once a study in Germany why Vietnamese um, immigrants are way more successful than others. And it turns out that it's because they're focusing on two things. First on family, mm -hmm. on cohesion, support and solidarity, and second on education. Mm. So um, that explains why they're successful uh, overseas and we should do the same here. Well, once again, thank you very much for this sharing today and uh, we wish you all the best for your future here with Vietnam. Thank you so much. And that is the end of our program. So this is a special journey with Philip from Vietnam to uh, Germany and then to Switzerland and then back to Vietnam. So it's like a full circle. And on this journey, he uh, has done many things to help support uh, Vietnam, the country where he was born. And we also learned that Vietnamese overseas all over the world, whoever they are, can contribute to the development of the country in their own way. So that is the end of our story today. Thank you very much for watching and we'll see you next time. <laughs>